It's another beautiful day on the island of Barbados, and I'm at the Colony Club by Elegant Hotel, which is located on Barbados' west coast. It's a wonderful hotel property that you could choose to experience a tropical paradise. I'm the host of Unctad Conversations. My name is Belle Holder. Today we're going to be talking to the Honorable Cynthia Ford, who is Minister of People Empowerment and Elderly Affairs. She works tirelessly for the people who she serves and she's also very passionate. That conversation is straight ahead. I'm really honored to have the opportunity to have this conversation with you. When I think about your ministry and what you're charged with, people empowerment and elder affairs, that could mean some of the most vulnerable in our society. What does that mean for you and the work that you have to do? It is very complex, but it is heartwarming when we see those persons who are under our care lift themselves out of dependence in most instances to, let to, to get to a level of independence. And I'm referring to first, the National Disabilities Unit, where that is one of the sections under us and uh, the programs that have been instituted help with the empowerment. Um, particularly now that we see that people, younger people in particular, are becoming disabled from accidents and falls and other matters that impact on their health and they're able to go to that institution if they go blind because of glaucoma or whatever the situation, they can pursue a course called assistance to blindness so that they get to understand how to be properly oriented, be properly oriented in the society to be able to still continue to live and live well and be accepted. Um, well, we do have a, a, a very novel program where we have a two acre lot in St. Philip and Mangrove. And thanks to the Barbados Workers Union, they have been able to lease it to us with a peppercorn price. And uh, that is now a venture that is unfolding because a lot of people are of the belief that disability is inability. And uh, we intend to empower them yeah. through synergies with the Ministry of Agriculture and the National Conservation Commission to help those persons who are willing to be a part of it to grow their own fruits and vegetables as well as to help them with the marketing. So the Max Wilton location where they now are after all those years um, climbing 21 stairs, now persons with wheelchairs and other um, devices that will assist them in their movement and so on, they are Max Wilton of Colombo Rock and it is more more amenable to them to be able to go to and fro. So they're planning every Saturday to have some kind of entrepreneurship market where the produce then will be marketed yeah. and they can raise funds for themselves and their families. And of course, there are so many other synergies that the National Disability has when it comes to the Council for the Disabled and Barnard right. and all those extremely talented. You know Patrick Ford, and he is a fantastic um, person who works with upholstery but when you see him break dance with no legs on his hands, it brings the crowd down. Right. So it says that, yes, and we have to make facilities available for them, whether it be in the form of employment, through entertainment, or whichever form. You know, people with disabilities is and always will be near and dear to my heart because my younger brother is autistic. Yes. and grew up here in Barbados. Mm -hmm. And then my family had the opportunity to relocate to Canada where we saw the comparison that we were able mm -hmm. to make in terms of what is afforded to people with disabilities shows me that we, we as in Barbados, we still have a long way to go, we do. but we're working toward it. Because mm -hmm. you mentioned accessibility, and I remember the Council for the Disabled really focused on accessibility for all. They had a campaign a few years ago, and we'd looked at just trying to traverse Bridgetown, where if you're in a wheelchair, you can't get onto the sidewalk, you can't go to some of the major stores on Broad Street. So, on, so even just outside of the communities, what are you looking at in terms of being able to change that? Well, we're, we're looking at sensitization right. because a lot of Barbadians, they're not as aware as they should be. And it's only when the shoe gets on their feet that they then really understand. So I have a tremendous difficulty with persons who park in locations that are specially designed to accommodate persons with disability, whether it be a car space or whatever. And you are quite right. We need to get that sensitization from the cradle to the grave. 
so that from in school, children learn to appreciate. In my career as a teacher, I taught children that were disabled, and I was a young woman, hadn't gone to Erdiston or anything, but I understand, and I understood then, the challenges that they had. And one day, one lady said to me, Miss Ford, you're pregnant, and you, you're, you're watching that child that's disabled. Suppose you copy him, and when finish your child is disabled too. And that was the level of ignorance right. from that teacher who asked me right. that, you know? So the sensitization is critical, but from the cradle to the grave, you have to do it, because unless the shoe is on your foot, then you don't understand and learn how to appreciate until perhaps you have a disabled child or until perhaps you lose your limbs. And we saw the Paralympics only last week and it right. overjoyed my heart to be able to see how they were so integrated in the system yeah. to become champions in their own rights and to show the world what the persons with disabilities can do. One of the key words in the theme for UNCTAD this year is vulnerability. So maybe we need to look at integration programs. This will be a little bit difficult now mm -hmm. with COVID as we mm -hmm. navigate that, mm -hmm. our new normal, mm -hmm. but integration programs perhaps within the schools so that children who are very young, who are fully able, mm -hmm. have have the opportunity to interact with children with disabilities and then they see and they learn from a very young age. Well we saw the revolution of that in Kamamir when then Senator, no Sen she was Senator before, Carrie Ann Eiffel, we had to tra transform most of the classrooms and everything at Kamamir was in the Ministry of Education then mm -hmm. and I saw the valiant effort and then we um, looked at the curriculum for the disabled and all that and when All Saints School was built in St. Peter it has a wing where children with disabilities were accommodated. And as a result, those who were good in mathematics, despite the disability, they were drafted into the regular classroom for mainstreaming. Mm -hmm. I don't know where it is at now, because I'm no longer in education, and of course I'm so deeply involved in what I'm doing, but I felt that that was a good springboard on which all of the other schools across Barbados should have the ramps, and I know that there is an effort towards doing that to facilitate them, and for teachers who may be disabled as well. Even in terms of our building codes, mm -hmm. you know, if you're putting up a new structure, then you need to consider and think about ac literally accessibility for all. That should be mandatory, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, um, I also want to talk about um, the elderly in our society. I think it's such an on, it's an on tap resource, that's how I refer to it, mm -hmm. where we have these wonderful individuals who came before and paved the way for us, who still have a lot to offer. What can you tell us about that? The country, again, is not as sensitized as I would expect when it comes to our aged. And there's nothing that pains me more than senior citizens who have been abandoned. Mm -hmm. Senior citizens who have been raped and robbed and beaten. And we are getting some pockets of that, but we have a special department in the police force that looks towards that and treats to it once the information is fed to them. So it calls for synergies with the other ministries and other um, community-based organizations, and of course, neighbors as well, to tell us what is happening. But the better side of it is, many of our senior season, uh, citizens excuse me, are aging with grace. And so that is right, the reason why the National Assistance Board has got the senior games. We were not able to have them in place last year because of COVID. And this year now, because the situation has um, gone to a worse stage, as exacerbated, we have not been able to do it. But there are other activities that are, they are engaged in to avoid the social distancing. Where they're doing some aspects of it on, um, on the virtual line and um, that is helping a lot but our seniors are our nation builders and they deserve the best of treatment and so um, the new project that we have for the elderly it is called the elder care companion project i believe that that will help us to be able to draw an element of of service and connectivity with our seniors because it is designed for persons living in the village where the seniors are who will know them well. The seniors may be their godmother, godfather, a neighbor who looked after them when they were small, when mothers and fathers were out working. Somebody in the neighborhood always used to keep the eye out for the children. And so when they can go back and say, godmother, this is Cynthia. I have come to see how you are doing. And grandmother will then sing hymns. She will tell stories. She will share the history and that godchild or that person from the neighborhood whom she or he knows and can trust will then be able to do some meditation, make a sandwich for them, 
according to the old people, pass the broom over the floor if they didn't have the chance to do it. Sit with them for two or three hours to be able to bring them back in line, especially now it's COVID time. Right. And a lot of our seniors are at home and they need oh. that kind of special attention and care because the children are out working or perhaps they live alone. Yeah. And so that to me is going to help to bridge that gap, that generational gap that we have lost. And I implore families, not only in Barbados, but across the world, to make those linkages where children and grandchildren can go back to granny and granddad and uncle and auntie who might be living alone and very lonely. And it really inspires them when they get to see the children and how they've grown and how they can interact with them. And in their conversations, pass on some morals, the values, the mores, the religion, everything else that would have put them in good stead for them to live to 80, 90, 100 years, and even 111 right. as our last person. So we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to continue to talk about um, the Ministry of People Empowerment and Elder Affairs, and we'll turn our attention to gender. Yes. We'll be right back. You're watching UNCTAD Conversations, and today we are sitting down with the Honorable Cynthia Ford, who is the Minister of People Empowerment and Elder Affairs. And I think we have to talk about issues around gender. I think COVID has brought some things to the fore, because even in listening to you talking about the Elder Care Compassionate Program, it's difficult, I would think, for a lot of elderly people because we have to physical distance, so you're, there are a lot of shut-ins as well. And so people um, are lonely and probably craving mm -hmm. that human contact. Um, how does gender affairs then factor into what you are already charged with in terms of what you want to accomplish? Well, the majority of the clients that the National Assistance Board has are women. Yes. And uh, there are males too. The number is smaller. Um, well, of course, I believe that when you look at the centenarians, it is most of the most women of the who women. are the oldest. And every other week, you are hearing of one either celebrating or passing to the great beyond. And uh, I would like for the chronicling of the history of those senior citizens. But when it comes to um, aspects to do with gender and all that, um, we do have some wonderful moments and some are sad. And if I'm shifting a bit, it is because of my concern and my deep concern with women, particularly women. Yes, I love men too, but the whole aspect of gender-based violence is women. And I am sad. I am extremely upset and concerned because so far this year we've had two women who were so brutally murdered. Last year, another one. And while I appreciate that we cannot only focus on women because we do have young men who are destroying other men as well, whether it be through injury or death, I believe that our Gender Affairs Department has a very important role to play in passing on or embracing those men's and women's groups that they can sit around the table, they can go into the communities as they do to be able to communicate with others to say there's something called conflict resolution. And COVID has made a bad situation worse because we have many females in particular who have been battered, badly beaten, and have to leave home, sometimes running with their children. And it is something that we have started to look at. Mm -hmm. But when you look at how the resources are now, it makes it difficult. And we do have a location where there are battered women. And uh, thankfully, a non-governmental organization, the Suroptimists, no, the Business and Professional Women's Club. The Soroptimist is looking after senior citizens too, as you will know in, 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 the, in the Eden Lodge area. Right. But the Business and Professional Women's Club, they get a large subvention from the government and they look after the needs of those battered women. But when it comes to battered women, then there are children. And those children are shut away with their parents because the parents are for the women are for to go out. Some of them may get the chance to go to work, but because of the intricacies and the safety that is required, we do not allow persons to know where that location is right. because we don't want them to be followed. When you see the types of issues that you are seeing and witnessing in the community, 
what do you want to make sure comes out of UNCTAD and let's make those linkages now. What should be on the table that we can see some serious changes yes. to protect those people who might be vulnerable? Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with you that we should be able to put forward to them. And of course, there are studies and there are projects that they would have done internationally that we can draw on. I mean, and I believe that is the reason why we are coming together as a region and as the rest of the world to be able to share the best practices of whatever projects we've pursued so that persons can follow them, implement them in, in a cultural way as well, because, because of cultures, different cultures, we can't do it all the same way, but at least get people to understand we are human beings and we need to live together as one and that we will not tolerate girls being raped and women being beaten and bruised and, and disenfranchised in a number of ways as we see is happening in the rest of the world. I, have, so, mm -hmm. I don't mean to simplify the issue at all. That's mm -hmm. not, of course, never my intention. Mm -hmm. But I have a question about what causes a, a gender shift in our society. Our families in Barbados are largely matriarchal. We have a lot of single women who are raising children, boys and girls. Correct. So then my question is, what is it that happens, where does the shift take place and that causes our boys to change? Because the rules that I have for my daughter are the same rules I have for my son. Mm -hmm. And I know historically, you know, that you would think we have to protect our girls, but then the boys can run wild. Do you see what I mean? Yep. But so, there, what is it that happens? What is it that goes wrong that causes our boys to behave in a particular way that then becomes negative to the detriment of our girls? You are on spot. And I believe it is because of tradition that we nurture our boys and girls differently, or we raise them differently. Uh, I remember as a child with parents telling the girls, come in here and learn to sew and to cook and to knit and to raise your family. So girls had doll babies and all the different things that girls would want to gravitate towards. But boys were told, look, go outside and roll a roller. Go and pelt a rock at a bird. Go and pitch marbles. Many of the girls didn't dare go and pitch marbles or climb a tree, but the boys could do it. And the boys would come home and they felt like, and of course, our women, and I believe, and I know for a fact, having done some psychology and so in the teaching profession, that many of our girls, the larger majority of our girls, perform better in school, despite whatever level of school it is, right. better than boys. And I suspect, because I haven't done that kind of research, that it is because of how we nurture our boys to be on the outside, to be mandy, or to be macho and ignore. And then, of course, because of slavery again and our African ancestry, our men were always the major breadwinners. So women stayed at home as housewives and they cared for their children. And you can tell the difference between children who are cared with a housewife, both boy and girl, compared to children who's both, who have both parents out in the field working. Because that housewife is gonna make sure, sit here, do some homework, make something useful, have manners, read a book a little bit, whether a boy or girl, come let me care for you, let me spruce you up. Brush the boys' hair. There is a special thing about brushing boys' hair. <laughs> but parents, females in particular, feel well, it's okay. The girls are more beautiful. Put ribbons in their hair and bubbles and earrings in their ear. And I saw it when I was in the classroom. Boys will come in to me with hair on comb, clothes unkempt. And the girls that are the sisters coming in with uniforms and pleats and everything in order. It is because how we socialize them. Right. So then we need to make a yes. cultural shift. We then. So um, then where does that start? It has to start in the household. So then yes. you need to educate parents yes. because we may be focusing on the children, but often children who are in a vulnerable situation, when you pluck them out and you work with them during the day, they have to go back into that household. We're gonna take a quick break. Yes. And when we come back, we're gonna yes. talk more about that. Cause I also yes. wanna talk about then when we're talking about things that are so personal, mm -hmm. how do we measure success? We'll be right back. We've been having a conversation that is clearly very personal. And I, when we're having these conversations, 
I often wonder about the men who are good men, who are doing the right things. What are those positive men saying about reaching their peers? Many of them will try, I believe. And I saw men in the PTA who did excellent work with their children. Uh, and it is so unfortunate that I don't think that the conversation is going far enough. And the only way we can help to arrest it is with community groups, schools and PTAs, and the government through the parenting programs, helping to be able to let us overcome that threshold. Mm -hmm. We now have got some trainer of trainers that have been developed over the last year. There would have been a project in parenting before with another administration, but of course I don't think that enough had happened. And when we were ready to spring out with our project, in kicked COVID and the interacting and so had been minimized, but we have about 40 trainer of trainers who are now expected to go into the communities and work with churches, other faith-based groups, and community groups, because that is the kind of interaction we require if we are to make good of opportunities so that there's no division between boys, raising boys and girls, but there are human beings who deserve to be nurtured and nurtured well, mm -hmm. but we need more men to come on board. And we too, in our gender affairs department, are working When you're doing this groups. type of work, when you are doing this type of work, how do you measure success? How do you, where's, you see what I mean? How do you even look at empirical evidence? Because I always say numbers are never just numbers. Mm -hmm. Numbers are people, the feelings, with loved ones, with families. So how do you measure the success well, when you're doing this type of work? Mm -hmm. We have a research department and um, they take the evidence and they compile the information. It's not always well known. Um, because of the other aspects of the ministry that are so much in the eyes of the public that everybody wants an answer to what's happening to the aged, what's happening to the disabled, HIV, and so on. And, and it's never reached the stage it should reach. Um, but we try our best through the various agencies to be able to reach in the communities and to set up programs. And, and I think it is noteworthy that the MISA group, the Men's Education Department, now most of the members are aging, mm -hmm. but there is a group with Mr. Sargent, his Christian name eludes me now, but he has got some wonderful young men going into communities, working with them, training them, and there might be a couple others, because in the past, they were mostly women's group, and the women were focusing on women and so on. But now we've got some young men's group in groups emerging to be able then to integrate and to pass on and to have seminars and go on trips and so on to be able to reach those men who really need it and they're hurting and I support them 100%. Does this feel daunting for you sometimes? No, it does not because I see elements of success every day. Mm -hmm. And then when I don't see the success coming as rapidly, we have our meetings by Zooms. I go in and put in my hands and, and I try to be a part of it because that is all I know in this lifetime. And what I was telling you about Israel that touched my heart, we in Barbados need to incorporate something that into our classrooms. They had a grandfather's project where grandfathers were in the classroom with the nursery children and the, like the, the early infants, and they will sit in the classroom. And at some point, they will teach the little boys how to hammer a nail to a piece of, a piece of wood, how to make a tire, like how we used to, not, not we, but my generation, <laughs> would make rollers and put them with a piece of wire and get that kind you know of what? male activity. But Minister Ford, if you're not reaching the children through the sexy technology, mm -hmm. can we really keep their attention? Yes, I believe so. It depends on how the opportunities or the sessions are being offered because we expect them to sit with hands in lap and don't say anything, it is me in charge mentality. That subtracts for what is happening. So I do community group work. Mm -hmm. And my children wait for Saturday mornings. I've halted now because of COVID, but they wait for Saturday mornings. And it's not to do with the sandwich or anything. It is to do with the interaction, dramatization, storytelling, Bible reading competitions, and that is what they need. And I pray that the ministry um, responsible for sports and community developments will development and youth affairs will continue to work in the communities and to transform these children so that it's not always in the house and sitting, because we have children sitting on their laptops and their other devices, sometimes for hours. And it bothers me, because just now, 
I don't know what will attract them, will attract them to the classroom when teachers may have to do some face-to-face -face teaching beyond the use of the computer or when they have to go into different environments. Our children need physical activity and sometimes the meals we give them as well help to create the kind of activity and our parents must supervise them, I must tell you, yeah. with those computers. I wanted to find out from you now on a personal level and, I, and actually I know all of this is largely personal yes. for you in terms of the work that you do, but how do you do it? How do you balance in all of this and take care of Cynthia in the middle of it, who then has to reach all of these people? I wish it were Cynthia alone that I look <laughs> after. Uh, but I must tell you that having been a community worker all my life, along with the school, the teaching, um, when I joined teaching in 1970, January, I had to join the disaster management organization. Zero at that time, I joined the Cub Scout movement. I joined as a leader, as well as the brownies with the Girl Guide movement. And that is what teachers were expected to do if they were to stay into the system and bring that whole set of community spirit and skills and all the other offerings to be able to keep the connection. And the other thing is the ministry used to allocate teachers in the communities where they lived so that the teachers knew the parents. And when these children are disorderly or whatever, or there were challenges otherwise, you knew how to call the parents, how to walk to the house. But now we have a teacher living in St. Thomas, working in St. Lucie, and that, that will create um, some challenges. But I have not only been doing that kind of community work, I have raised grandchildren. Three plus a part of grandchild, meaning one that didn't live with me. And if the Lord spares the first granddaughter's life next week, she will be 26 years and still at my house because they know that I don't tolerate nonsense. <laughs> and, I, I, and, and other neighbors' children will come to my house, they will go with me wherever we do our own things. I did Sunday school, I did some about everything. I'm not boasting about it, but I'm saying that is what has helped me to become rounded. I've worked with senior citizens in the villages to be able to see how I can fill in and people help me to be able to look after old granny or granddad who lived alone. And I brought with me skills that I did not go to a university or a school of learning with, but the natural real life experience having been there on the ground. And I had the wonderful privilege to head up an organization called Women Against Poverty, where we took to Bridgetown every Saturday morning for like a month or two when the structural adjustment was taking place and the salaries were cut and so on. Right. And out of that, wonderful women came on board and helped to share the responsibilities of nurturing women and men. So I'm saying that we can find ways of sharing and caring and we can engage women and men in our communities to work with our children. We just need to make sure that they're not pedophiles because that is the other problem where you're not seeing a lot of girls on the playing field. Parents have to be careful as well. And I'm not saying that all men are pedophiles, because there are women who are pedophiles too across the world. And therefore, coming together with UNCTAD and all the other stakeholders, I believe that we can make a tremendous difference in the experiences that we will develop and the kinds of policies and programs that we can look towards implementing to make that tremendous difference. And I am really proud. When you process all of this and everything that's happening in the world, it is easy to be overwhelmed. And so I'm happy to hear that you are not daunted by no, the please. task ahead. No, please. But you are focused yes. and you are engaged with the concept of just reaching who you can. Yes. Thank you so much.